Chapter 1. We are 13, almost 14, and these streets of Sea Cliff are ours. We walk these streets to our school perched high over the Pacific, and we run these streets to the beaches, which are cold, windswept, full of fishermen and freaks. We know these wide streets and how they slope how they curve toward the shore, and we know their houses. We know the towering brick house where the magician Carter the Great lived. He had a theater inside and his dining room table rose up through a trap door. We know that Paul Kantner from Jefferson Starship lived or maybe still does live in the house with the long swing that hangs above the ocean. We know that the swing was for China, the daughter he had with Grace Slick. China was born the same year we were, and whenever we pass the house, we look for China on the swing. We know the imposing salmon-colored house that had a party at which masked robbers appeared. When a female guest wouldn't relinquish her ring, they cut off her finger. We know where our school tennis instructor lives, dark blue tutor decorated with cobwebs every Halloween, where the school's dean of admissions lives, White House with Black Gate. Both are women, both are wives. We know where the doctors and lawyers live and where the multi-generation San Franciscans live, the kind of people whose family names are associated with mansions and hotels in other parts of the city. And most important, because we are 13 and attend an all girls school, we know where the boys live. We know where the tall boy with webbed feet lives. Sometimes we watch Bill Murray movies with him and his friends at his house on Seaview Terrace and marvel at the way the boys can recite all the lines, the way we know every word of the outsiders. We know where the boy lives who breaks my necklace one day by the beach. It's a silver chain my mother gave me and he pulls it violently and I run from him. We know where the boy lives who comes to my house the day I get a canopy bed and mistaking it for a bunk bed, climbs up and breaks it. It's never properly fixed, and from then on, the four posts tilt west. We suspect this boy and his friends are responsible for writing in the wet cement outside our school, the Sprag School for Girls. Sprag is for girls who like to brag, the cement says. It's hard to tell if the words were traced with a finger or a stick, but the imprint is deep. Ha, we say. They don't even know how to spell brag. We know where the cute boy whose father is in the army lives. He just moved to San Francisco and he wears short sleeve plaid shirts that were the style in the Great Lakes town he came from. We know his father must have a position that's fairly high up because otherwise, why wouldn't he live in the Presidio where most people in the army live? We spend little time thinking about army hierarchy because their haircuts are so sad. We know where the boy with one arm lives, though we don't know how he lost it. He often plays tennis at the park on 25th Avenue or badminton in the alleyway behind his house, which is the alleyway that leads to my house. Many of the blocks in Sea Cliff have alleyways so the cars can park in the garages in the back, so the cars don't interfere with the view of the ocean, of the Golden Gate Bridge. Everything in Sea Cliff is about the view of the bridge. It was one of the first neighborhoods in San Francisco to have underground power lines because above ground power lines would obstruct the view. Everything ugly is hidden. We know the high school boy who lives next door to me. He comes from a family that was prominent in the gold rush. I learned that from my California history textbooks. Photos of his parents frequently appear in the society pages of the Knob Hill Gazette that's delivered to our doorstep every month free of charge. The boy is blonde and often has a group of his high school friends over to watch football in his living room. From my garden, I can see when they're watching a game. There's a three foot gap between the edge of our property and his house. And sometimes I leap through his window and land on the floor of his living room. I am that daring. I am a daring enigma. I fantasize that one of them will invite me to the prom. And then one afternoon, one of the boys grabs the waistband of my guest jeans. I try to get away and I run in place for a moment like a cartoon character. The boys all laugh. I'm upset for days. I know that this gesture and their laughter mean they think of me as a little girl and not as a prospective prom date. After that, their window is kept closed.
Then there are the Prospero boys, the sons of a doctor who lived in my house before my family bought it. They are legendary. They are a cautionary tale. When my parents toured the house, the floor of what would become my bedroom was littered with beer bottles and needles. The windows were broken. When I talk to older boys and tell them I live in the Prospero boys' old house, I get attention and, I imagine, momentary respect. No one can believe what lunatics those boys were. Moms will shake their heads and say how sad it was, those boys, their father being a doctor and all. The Prospero boys are the reason my parents were able to buy the house for the price they did. It was destroyed by these boys. No one else wanted to think their children would grow up to have parties and use needles and spray paint obscenities on the walls of their own home. My father has always been able to look past the damaged lives a house has witnessed. That is his secret power. He grew up in a rented third floor apartment on an alleyway in the mission, and like many of his friends, had multiple jobs by the time he was 15. Newspaper delivery boy, grocery store employee, doorman at the hate theater. He tore tickets six nights a week, and on his day off, he'd go see movies. When he was in middle school, he biked all the way to Seacliff to go to the beach, and he saw the majestic houses and said to his friends, one day I will live in this neighborhood. One day he did. My mother grew up without money too. She grew up in a large, happy family on a farm in rural Sweden. And together they are a thrifty pair. No meals out at restaurants, no heat turned on unless there's company, and sometimes no heat even then, just the strong smell of fish. My sister, Svea, who is 10, is the only one in our family who likes fish, but it is served weekly because we are Swedish. In the front room of my house, there are five large windows that look out on the Golden Gate Bridge. On foggy days, the bridge is blanketed in white, no trace of it visible. On days like this, my father used to tell me that robbers had stolen the bridge. Don't worry, Ulibi, he'd say to me. The police are after them. They've been working all night. By mid-morning, when the fog began to burn off, he'd say, look, they got them. They're putting the bridge back. It was a story I never tired of and reinforced two lessons that reigned over my childhood. One, hard work conquers all obstacles. Two, good triumphs over evil, which is always lurking. There are alerts, of course, and warnings. And in Seacliff, these warnings come in the form of foghorns. First one foghorn and in the distance, another. The deep, bellowing foghorns are the soundtrack to my childhood. When we go to the beaches, which we often do, huddled in sweaters and with mist on our faces, the foghorns are even louder than they are in our houses. They punctuate our confessions, our laughter. We laugh a lot. When I say we, I sometimes mean the four of us Seacliff girls who are in the eighth grade at the Sprague School for Girls. But when I say we, I always mean Maria Fabiola and me. Maria Fabiola is the oldest of three children. The youngest ones are twin boys. She moved to Seacliff the year we started kindergarten. Nobody knew much about her family. Sometimes she says she's part Italian. Other times she says she's not. Why would you think that? Other times she says her grandfather was the prime minister of Italy, or could have been prime minister, or she was related to the mayor of Florence, or could have been. She has long, dark brown hair and light green eyes. Even in black and white photos, you can see their ethereal color. There are dozens of photos in her home of her and her cousins sitting atop horses or on the edge of swimming pools surrounded by grass. The photos are taken by professionals and displayed in identical silver frames. Maria Fabiola is a noticer, but also a laugher. She has a laugh that starts in her chest and comes out like a flute. She is known for her laugh because it's what people call a contagious laugh, but it's not contagious in the usual way. Hers is a laugh that makes you laugh because you don't want her to laugh alone. And she's beautiful. An older boy wearing corduroy OP shorts near Kazar Stadium once said she was hot and with any other girl we would call bullshit, but with her, we believe it. The compliment, the boy, the corduroy OP shorts. She wears a thick stack of thin silver bracelets on her arm. We all wear these bracelets, which we buy on Hate Street, three for a dollar, or on Clement Street, five for a dollar, but she wears more of them. 
When she laughs, her hair falls in front of her face and she sweeps it out of her eyes with her fingers, causing her bracelets to cascade up her arm. The sound of her bracelets is like her laughter, high pitched and delicate, a waterfall of notes. She has perfect hair and always will. When we were in kindergarten, Maria Fabiola and I began walking to school together with older girls who went to Sprague. These girls would pick up Maria Fabiola at her house at the top of China Beach and wind their way up El Camino del Mar and collect me. Together, we'd walk the wide, well-paved street to pick up another girl who lives in the house that looks like a castle, it has a turret, and then continue to school. The older girls passed down their knowledge of houses to us, and we combine this with the information we have from our parents. When we become the older girls at Sprague, we teach the younger girls about the houses, about who lives where, about which gardeners are pervy. From grades kindergarten until fourth, we wear plaid green jumpers over white blouses with Peter Pan collars. In fifth grade through eighth grade, we wear <clears throat> pleated blue skirts that stop right above the knee and white sailor middies. It is the see-through white middies that provoke the gardener's comments. You are not so little anymore, they say staring at our chests. When we are 13, Maria Fabiola and I walk with two other girls, Julia and Faith. Julia used to live a few houses up the street from me in a home that looked like it could fall into the ocean. Her mom is a retired professional ice skater with a wall of medals, so Julia skates too. Julia has shoulder length light brown hair that shines blonde in the sun and has blue eyes that she insists on calling cobalt. She briefly dated a boy from Pacific Heights until one night on the phone, she asked him what color her eyes were and he said blue and he was done for. Julia's half sister, Gentle, is 17. She's the daughter of Julia's father and his first wife who was a hippie. Then Julia's father made money and the first wife couldn't stand the hypocrisy. So she left him and Gentle and moved to India. That's when Gentle's father married the ice skater. It's hard for Julia to have a half-sister like Gentle. Gentle used to attend the Sprague School for Girls until she got kicked out. She goes to Washington, the public high school, which makes her one of the only people we know who goes there. The kids who go to Washington look huge and their coats are enormous. They give the finger to cops and even firemen. She used to babysit for me and Svea sometimes until my parents found out that one night when I was 11 and she was 15, she taught me how to smoke. Gentle has long tangled mouse brown hair and wears bell bottoms. She used to have hippie friends, but now we usually see her alone. She's often drunk, stoned on acid. Once we were at the playground by the golf course next to Sprague and we saw a crowd gathering and laughing at something. Julia, Maria Fabiola, and I went to see what it was, and there was Gentle, naked and swinging from the monkey bars. Julia was furious. She ran home to tell her mom and didn't come to school the next day. After a business scandal that was on the front page of the Chronicle, Julia's family had to move to a small house on the other side of California Street, beyond the border of Seacliff. They said they were only living there while doing construction on their main house, but I haven't seen any workers at their old house. And I overheard my father tell my mother that he read in a real estate report that it had been sold. Now they have no view of the ocean. Now they use their garage for a spare room and park their car on a street. Between the scandal and having to move, we all feel bad for Julia, but we mostly feel bad for her because nobody would want a half sister like Gentle. My mom says she respects Julia's mom because it must be incredibly challenging to be a stepmother to such a lost girl. All the music Gentle likes is about drugs or the bands do drugs or look like they do drugs. Everything about Gentle is grubby and unwashed but this is the 80s and the 80s are clean and the colors are bright and separated. Then there's Faith, she's one of us. Faith moved to San Francisco last year in seventh grade and lives in a house that extends an entire block on Seaview. She has long red hair that on some days makes her look like Anne of Green Gables and on other days like Pippi Longstocking. She plays goalie on the soccer team and is always diving for the ball, her hair streaming behind her like a flag. 
she has this air about her like she knows she's special and maybe it's because she resembles famous literary characters or maybe it's because she's adopted her father is a lot younger than her mother they had a daughter but she died and so they adopted faith to replace her the dead daughter's name was faith too which i think is strange and julia thinks is horrendous because her favorite word is horrendous but Faith doesn't mind that she was named after the dead daughter. In fact, sometimes she says she feels like she's 20 because the original Faith lived to be seven and Faith is now 13. I don't know what Faith's mom was like before the original Faith died, but she now acts like life is a large broken car she's pushing down the road. She walks diagonally as though she's making her way through a rainstorm, even on the fairest of days. The four of us, Maria Fabiola, Faith, Julia, and I, own these streets of Sea Cliff. But it's Maria Fabiola and I who know the beaches the best. Maybe it's because our houses are closest to the shore. I'm up the street from China Beach, a four minute walk, and her house is just above the beach. We take the boys from Seaview to the beach and under their gaze, we see how agile we are. We can feel our power as we race on all fours over the cliffs. We know their crevices and footholds, their smooth inclines and their rugged patches. If there were an Olympic category for climbing these cliffs, we would enter it. We scale them as though we are in training. After an afternoon at the beach, the pads of our fingers are rough and our palms smell of damp rock and the boys are dazzled. China Beach is adjacent to a bigger beach, Baker Beach, and they're separated by a promontory. But Maria Fabiola and I know how to traverse between these two beaches, at, between the two beaches at low tide. We know how to read the ocean, how to navigate the slippery rocks so that if we time it perfectly, we can wait until the ocean starts to inhale its waves and through a combination of climbing and scurrying, make our way to Baker Beach. Once on a class outing to China Beach, we knew the tide was right to make a mad dash around the bluff and end up at Baker. Other classmates followed us. When our teachers yelled for us to come back, Maria Fabiola and I timed the waves and ran. Our classmates didn't know the beach the way we did, hesitated and got stuck on the other side. The teachers panicked. We assured them it would be okay. We climbed over the bluff and held our classmates' hands watched the ocean and guided our classmates back to China Beach. We tried to remain humble, but we were heroes. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Marin. I love hearing you read that. It was so fun. I was like, I kept wanting to hear you. I almost forgot to unmute myself. Um, I am so I'm so honored that you you read the audiobook for We Run the Tides. I really, it was my dream. I always listen. I pick books that I'm going to listen to for on audio based on books that you read. And I'm just so honored that you read this book. And it was so fun to get to listen to you read the words that I wrote. So thank you so oh much. Oh my goodness. Amazing. It's totally my, my pleasure. It's a joy to get to do it again. I, I It's just a total joy. I, I'm, I, I love it so much. Thank you for, for asking me both times. <laughs> thank you. Um, amazing. Okay. So um, hi. hi. <laughs> I'm adjusting my light because I'm in my office, which is a former hot tub um, by the hour rental place. But now with COVID, you can't actually, I don't think people are taking hot tubs by the hour. So I have a skylight because I guess every hot tub office place needs a skylight to let out the steam. And now the sun's moving. So that's why my, I'm adjusting my oh, light. Oh yeah, it's still sunny out there. I forgot yeah, about that. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, are you in New York? York? You're in I'm New, York. New York. I'm in New York. I'm in New York. In dark, cold New York. Um, anyways, congratulations. I'm so happy to be talking to you about this and I'm so happy to give you the test that I'm going to give you right now. Oh, no. <laughs> it's going to be a test. Um, I'm sure you're going to pass because, um, uh, because I think you got pretty good grades when you're in school. Um, anyways, uh, here's how it's going to go. We're going to do this. Um, so everybody knows, um, I'm going to show a sentence that Vendela wrote. She might deny that she wrote it, but she did write it and she's going to read it aloud. Just one little sentence here and there. Then I'm going to show her some images 
And um, hopefully she'll recall that these images come from her book, but you know, who knows? There could be a trick image in there, who knows? There might be an image- Maybe you're testing me. Yeah. I'm testing you. Do you know your own book? <laughs> um, and uh, she will respond to these images however she likes. And um, for those of you who were alive in the 80s, which I definitely was not, this might be very nostalgic making for all of you. Um, and then um, because I want everybody to have a test, there'll be a test for everybody at the end not just Bendela. Okay, so pay attention, I guess is my point. Okay, um, okay so here we go. Uh, um, all right, go ahead. You read those sentences there, Vendela Vita, that you wrote. Okay, the first sentence, uh, this is the first sentence of the book. We are 13, almost 14, and these streets of Seacliff are ours. And the second sentence, which is not from the same paragraph, is we want all the boys to pay attention to us. We want to want. And and is that related to anything in particular that particular Those sentences doesn't, doesn't um, come from they've just watched a movie that is from oh the second one does I mean, I'll start by talking about the first one because I'll go in the test in order um oh, yeah sure okay so here while we do that I'm going to do some photos um, okay the, perfect yeah go ahead just tell me um, so we are 13 almost 14 and the streets are Seacliff our ours came it was a this book actually did not start as a book about teenagers it started um, strangely enough, as a book about Trump, um, I started writing the first page of it, a nonfiction book after the 2016 elections, and I became really obsessed with cataloging Trump's lies, and I became very um, captivated by the writing of Cicela Bach, the Swedish American philosopher who actually in a, you know, profiled in the Believer magazine many years ago, and she, um, I, she talks a lot about pollution and how one lie can kind of create this pollution of other lies. And after a while, you know, I spent about a year working on a nonfiction book about lying. And then I realized I actually wanted to write a fictional book. And I wanted to, I thought, who are better liars than teenage girls? Because they're naturally shapeshifters and are trying on all these new identities. And I don't even think that's a bad thing. I actually think as a teenage girl, you should be trying on new identities and trying things out. Um, and the trick is actually when you grow up to actually stop trying on new identities and um, to stop lying. I actually think that's a, that's my definition. It's kind of my definition writing this book. That the definition of an adult, in my opinion, is someone who, who actually tells the truth about themselves, and other people. So wow. that's some people say it's like when you start making, you know, dentist appointments. That's when you're an adult. But I think it's you start you make the dentist appointments, but then you forget about them and you don't go. Are you? Still or you lie about them? <laughs> then you're like cancel yourself out. Can lie about flossing? Are you still an adult? <laughs> <laughs> Can lie about flossing a little bit. <laughs> And then the second sentence, we want all the boys to pay attention to us. We want to want, um, you know, it's funny. I, I didn't want to, this book is not autobiographical. And it's not about my life and there are kidnappings in the books in the book. And that was not part of San Francisco. I've heard from like German readers who are like, Did, were there lots of kidnappings in the eighties in San Francisco? And like, no, that's all fictional. Um, and I, because I didn't want it to be about my life. I didn't really look at any diaries or anything from that time period when I was growing up in the eighties. But I did remember that sensation of just of wanting so badly. Like you, you didn't even know what you wanted. You just wanted this? to want something. And in this line, they found to go, went to go see the Breakfast Club, I think. And they just they want to feel the gaze of like they want people to pay attention to them. Mm -hmm. And it's actually funny because I found um, after I finished the book, actually quite recently, my mother gave me my old an old diary that I brought here to my office, Heidi, because I know that you. Wrote the folded clock a book that i love which is you know diary entries and it's based on looking at your why are you shaking your head i'm not i don't I love it that. i mean i I'm, <laughs> i didn't write that <laughs> um i and i remember um anyway I, I thought that it was funny to look back i think for the book if i'm not mistaken i don't want to put words in your mouth but you look back at the diaries that you kept as a child trying to see some evidence of the writer that you would become and you found what what did you I'm not what did you find when you looked at your diaries? I mean they sucked. I was a terrible writer and <laughs> that's what I found. <laughs> well, I found that I this is my, my diary, my, my private journal that I'm sharing with you from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, because I was very mature. Um I was 12 and I wrote, I hope to have lots of lovers in high school. It's great to be in love as long as it doesn't affect your grades. Um, so I think I was just was laughing when I found that and I, I, my whole family was laughing because I was just such a, a dork in the sense that I, I knew that I, I wanted to have lovers. I knew I wanted to want to have them, but I was also scared of wanting to have lovers um, because of my grades. So <laughs> that's what that sentence was. We want to want um, is reflecting that that sensation or that feeling you feel when you're that age. What are these photos? Well, okay, so these are so these are the two. I mean, this is kind of 
this is a uh, um hate ashbury and the hippies which from this sentence which uh marin already read mm -hmm. about the 80s and the 80s are clean and the colors are bright and separated such as the esprit esprit. catalog um mm -hmm. and esprit clothing but um i want to move back up here and talk about these sentences right here because Maybe it's clear from um, Marin's reading, but for those who um, need further enticement to read this book, one of the things I find so remarkable about it are the omissions in this book. And so I thought maybe if you could just read these things and then um, talk a little bit about, I have some questions for you. Okay. So this comes in a couple chapters into the book. Um, I look around and suddenly Maria Fabiola isn't with us. A cool salt, she's at, um, I should preface that they're at um, Faith's house for a slumber party, for a birthday party. They've just gone to see a breakfast club and now they're at the house with her, her father and her mother. I look around and suddenly Maria Fabiola isn't with us. A cool saltwater breeze enters the house and we follow it through the open back door into the garden. Faith's father is sitting outside in the dim light having a drink. He's sitting on a short white bench that I realize is a swing. It's the kind of swing that you see in musicals or plays set in the South. Seated next to him on the swing is Maria Fabiola. And there's a ellipsis there. Then we hear Faith shrieking too. Her father shot himself. So there's there are a few lines in between those paragraphs, but basically what I wanted, the book is so much about seeing and not seeing. And there's a whole scene in the book, the pivotal scene in the book is the girls are on their way to school one day and they see a man in a car, in a white vintage car. And um, and they have a discussion about whether they see, whether he's doing something or not, and that becomes the whole discussion between the girls and also becomes a reason later on that um, Eula B, the protagonist is ostracized from the other girls because she does not see what they claim they saw and they don't she doesn't support their version of events. So a lot of it is about seeing and not seeing and so I didn't want to say exactly what Maria Fabiola sees I mean what Fa what Eula B sees Maria Fabiola doing with face father, um, but that's what, because she's not even sure herself she's too young to really even understand. Exactly, she's too shocked. But um, it's funny because I'm working on a screenplay version of the book right now, and I think in the in the screenplay I'm making that more clear because there are things that you have to make clear when you're showing something on film versus in a novel when you can say what you saw or didn't see. So how are you going to make it more clear? First of all, I want you to identify um, these two things on the screen. Oh, uh, so Milan Kundera's *The Unbearable Lightness of Being*, which is a book that it plays a part in the in the novel, and Eula B even wants goes so far as to buy a bowler hat because she becomes obsessed with. The women and the role models she finds in the women in unbearable lightness of being and Fiorucci is a t shirt that one of the girls is wearing at the sleepover and um, I really like that Fiorucci shirt do you own that Heidi. No, but I just wanted to um, put it out there that if anyone wants me to um, I was we were joking that we should do shop the look for the book, and so if anyone wants <laughs> to um, look for any of these items for them, this I think is from Etsy actually so if anyone wants the link I'm happy to send it to you. <laughs> They can contact you in the chat and you can help. Not okay. The chat. Yes, my rates are good. My personal shopping rates are very, very low. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I thought it was so interesting also that, um, I mean, another pretty, I don't want to call it an omission, but um, Yulabi is um, sexually assaulted at a party. Mm -hmm. um, and we see the this is described to us because it's happening in real time. Um, but then what is omitted is actually any of her processing of it or her even mentioning it to ever, ever to anybody again, including us. And mm -hmm. I thought that was another interesting omission choice on your part. Well, I chose to admit that because I felt like in the 80s, there wasn't this awareness of like sexual harassment the same way there is now that I feel like our daughters, our teenage daughters have, and we know what's wrong. But I feel in the 80s, there was still this sense of like, there was stranger danger, right? Like stay away from strangers. But if it was someone you knew, you just, there wasn't as much of a conversation around it. And so I deliberately didn't have Eula B tell anyone or talk to anyone about it because I felt like that wasn't something that would have happened at that at that time. Um, if it was taking place now, it'd be a totally different kind of book. Um, so, and also I think there's a part that you where Eula B is part of herself that she thinks it's okay that what happens to her happens because she's seen Maria Fabiola and Faith's father together outside in the garden. So there are all these omissions are kind of like playing you know kind of lining up and i feel you know sexuality i think with teenage girls is often like lies in a weird way like they're passed along like someone tells a lie and it gets passed along or someone else starts lying and i think the same thing can happen when girls are coming of age if someone is like the first one to kiss a boy maybe their friend is going to do like that experience and passed along so another person might be more willing to kiss a boy and etc cetera, etc cetera, and, you know and it gets kind of like a dare like you up the ante yeah yeah 
<laughs> I remember I'm just having this memory actually of uh, this friend of mine, her older sister um, had gone away to boarding school because she was um, a problem kid and she came back. And I remember her saying like, oh yeah, everyone's had sex by the time they're sophomores in high school. And I think I was maybe like in seventh grade or something. And I just remember this panic of like, oh my God, I'm going to have to have sex in three years. You know, <laughs> like it didn't even- You're doing the math already, yeah. Yeah, right? It didn't, it wasn't even like pressure. It was just like, oh, oh, that's when that happened. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. It, was, it was a fact, yes. It was a fact. It was totally a fact. Yeah. Um, so, okay, let's do, um, I'm interested in- um, I'm interested in that t-shirt. I want to get that afterwards. That t-shirt, I'll, I'll help you out with that. Um, okay, so here is this, uh, yeah, talk to me a bit about what's happening here. Um, so on the, so it's Call of the Wild by Jack London, a scene with the bowler hat in Unbearable Lightness of Being from the movie, and then Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. And these are all books that are referenced in We Run the Tides. And the Call of the Wild, um, so there's an English teacher at Sprag at the all-girls school that the girls go to in, in my novel and their teacher is named Mr. London and he's really young. He's one of those teachers. I think everyone's had those teachers who's really just too young to be teaching, especially an all girls school. You know, they're just out of college and they're clean shaven and there's something so young about them. Mr. London is someone who always likes, likes people to make the connection that maybe he might possibly be related to Jack London. And so he's always teaching Jack London. And he's also teaches Kidnapped by Robert Louis Stevenson. And I, the point I wanted to make with having um, Mr. London in the book is just how funny it is when you look back at the 80s, how much, even in an all girls school, these girls are being taught to look at themselves like through the male gaze. They're being taught books that are um, all by men. They're being taught books. Um, there's a scene where Eulaby in the novel gets great, gets a bad grade on a book report she does on Franny and Zoe because she doesn't like it as much as Mr. London does. And you know he he says that she doesn't understand Salinger and doesn't understand girls because she doesn't under, like the book. And so I just wanted to get that in the in the 80s as well and the, the sense of what the girls were being taught then. Um, and kidnapped plays a part too because ultimately Maria Fabiola is is kidnapped. And I don't want to give too much away about the plot, but um, this book has something to do with it. And the bowler hat and that scene is amazing um, in the movie. And I'm just reminded a friend, my cousin actually, when my cousin's in Holland he and his now wife on their first date, they went to go see that movie with his mom. They were like all sitting together watching that movie. And um, I don't know why I was just thinking how uh, comfortable that must've been I for the mom. Heard it all um, yeah, but, um, but I, uh, but yeah, that's a scene that I think is really, you know, when, in the, when that came out, I mean, I love that movie so much. Um, Bill Kaufman, the director, just, I think he did an incredible job adapting that, that book. Um, and I, that's all I can say, it plays a part in my book. Here's what I would say also coming off of this again, not wanting to ruin anything, but I am curious about the idea of like inspiration and plagiarism and like copycatting when you're mm -hmm. a um, teenager girl, a teenage girl in this case. And um, so there's like, yeah, people who are plagiarizing books in their life. Yeah. Essentially, like they're plagiarizing the book with their lives. And, um, and I just wondered, um, uh, how you thought about the reverse, like essentially taking real events and putting them into fiction. Um, oh, and, right. You know, and like yeah. how you think about that balance. Um, I think that there's something you have to have, if you're going to read something in the 80s in San Francisco, I think there's some, some sense of like, you know, the geography, like you can't mess with geography and pretend that something is the way they do in movies sometimes they're in San Francisco, they pretend like your beach is next to you know, the Coit Tower or something. And everyone in San Francisco is like, wait, what is going on? You can't do that in books if you want anyone to believe it. So I think um, by setting a book in a place, you have kind of, you have the real San Francisco and then you have your layer of San Francisco. And then you have like the events that, that could have happened at that time. And that's kind of a really fun thing. You, you know, I feel like it's like creating this third world. It's not so different from the world that you grew up in, but, or that you know, but it's, it's, not, it's not exactly, it's not your life. Yeah. 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 Um, okay, here, I'm going to go and um, let's see. I am, yeah, read a little bit of, from these, if you don't mind. Okay. Yeah, this is a scene when Eula B is complaining to her, her father um, about missing everything in San Francisco. So sometimes I feel like I missed all the interesting, I was about to say periods, but decide on epochs instead. My parents look at me quizzically. I probably didn't pronounce it right. Um, the reason she does that, there's just been a scene with her period, so. 
um, did I ever tell you about the time I saw Patty Hearst? My dad says. Anyway, I was going to the grocery store and I saw a Chevrolet parked on the street. There's a woman with glasses in the driver's seat staring straight ahead. And then in the back seat, behind what looked like a dog cage wired, was a woman lying down across the seats. And this house, um, and then he goes on to say that if he had actually called her in, um, you know, he would have gotten a reward, but he also might have been killed. And um, he says, and this house would have been would be a tourist attraction. All the tour bus drivers would go by and say, that's where they killed the man who revealed her Patty Hearst's location. Um, and so I wanted to, you know, I wanted to um, convey the sense that in the 80s in, in San Francisco, you really, you felt like you'd missed the party. You know, you really, there's just heard all these stories about what had happened and what had preceded you, but you felt like it was like arriving at the party when like, all, you know, the DJ is playing the worst music and so everyone's drunk or passed out and there's like soggy beer and all the food. That's what, that's what it was like in some ways. And, and I think a lot of us were really interested in Patty Hearst. Oh my gosh, that's her mug shot. I'm just realizing she's not very tall. She was five. Yeah. Five Isn't that crazy? It's true. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah. we were really, and there's the Zodiac killer. Is that the Zodiac killer? Um, it's or, also, yes. Yes. Um, very legendary. For him. Yes. Yeah. Um, and so Patty Hearst plays a part in it. And just the, the lore of San Francisco, you have all these like is activists like Angela Davis, you have all these people who were looming in the background in your head when you were growing up in San Francisco in the 80s. And so they also loom in the background of the characters heads, especially because these are girls in the book and they're looking at like it, role models, you know, and for them, they're just interested in Patty Hearst. And of course, because kidnapping is a theme of the book, they're kind of extra interested in her. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious about, uh, I think Hearst is such an interesting um, like specter that's kind of hovering over this book. Um, and uh, because these girls are like, they're victims who become heroes, who become criminals, and then they become victims again. And this kind of this, um, yeah, kind of like the uh, porousness maybe of those roles a little bit. And, mm -hmm. um, and I guess I'm curious, because you did talk about lying and you wanted to write a book about lying. And what's interesting about these girls is that they are liars technically, but I guess I would ask, are they sort of unwittingly like telling a truth about the city or about their lives that like the adults don't want to see? Yes, they are. That's really good. smart. That's good. That was the right answer. Yes. And I think that's very true. I also think it's I really like the way you phrase it. I'm not going to try to improve upon that because I think that was great. And um, I'm going to write that down and say it to myself. Um, but I, I think that what was also interesting about Patty Hearst is that, well, first of all, there's a little bit of interest. I was looking her up when researching the book. Do you know she married one of her bodyguards like after she was released from jail? She, yeah, you knew that. I um, thought that was interesting. But yeah, also the, her, the Hearst family looms so large too because they own, you know, newspapers and what you know I think it's so funny too to think back at like the day and I try to put this in the book too that ABC News and um, news stations anchor women and newspapers were such a big part of the culture at that time and that's how you got your news and they kind of like loomed large the way like TikTok does today or something that's where like you got all your your information from and I, so I think for us too just knowing that she was part of this family that was on the news and she was on, she was, that was making news but she was on the news was very very interesting to us. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to, we're going to do one more quick one and then I'm going to. What's my grade it. so far? My grade. I, I feel like I don't want to tell you because <laughs> stop crying. you're like, oh, I, I aced it. I can just like, it's, it's like second half of senior year if you already got into college and you didn't get in yet. So, um, <laughs> so this is actually, so Cliff House um, is near uh, Sea Cliff. It's around the corner, around the cliff, basically. And mm -hmm. I looked up some images and I didn't realize there was one obviously from the early 1900s that burned down. Um, and now it looks, actually it doesn't look like that either. It doesn't look like that, but the funny thing about the Cliff House is that it's closing now. Um, it's a big deal. And people who love the Cliff House are really sad about it. And I know um, Rachel Krishner actually wrote about this in this really beautiful piece she just wrote in the New Yorker about how a lot of people from the Sunset District um, San Francisco get Cliff House tattoos. Like it really was a part of, mm -hmm. of teenage years, like in hanging out there. And then my dad grew up in the city and he told me that across the street from the Cliff House or down this road there, um, there was actually an amusement park called like Playland at the Beach. And that's where everyone would go. But can you imagine a, an amusement park there, like on like oceanfront property must have been like, you know, I, I, I actually wish I had been alive at that time. I think that sounds really fun, even though I don't even like amusement parks. I know. 
Okay, I have another question, but I'm gonna, it's actually 8.15. I wanna give people a chance to um, ask you questions, but first, okay. everybody's test. Okay, everybody's test is, now this assumes that people saw this movie twice, once when they were younger and uh -huh. once when they were older. And the test is, were you attracted to somebody different when you were older than when you were younger? That's the mm. test. It's actually not a test, it's a question. Who were you attracted to when you were younger? And then were you attracted to someone different when you were older? And then I'm just gonna say that Judd Nelson grew up around the corner from me. So I feel- No, in Maine? Yeah, he grew, he grew up in Portland, Maine. Amazing. I know, right? Anyway, so there we go. People should feel free. If you don't know who these people are, then you have no business answering this question anyway. So I'm not <laughs> even gonna, I'm not even gonna tell you who they are. Um, I will say that predictably Judd Nelson, and then disappointingly, Judd Nelson. That's what I'll say about myself. <laughs> That's who you were attracted to and then, okay. Yeah. yeah, it didn't change, you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyways. I think, I think like probably the same. Yeah. 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 That's, and, so we yeah. don't change the, the morals. Yeah. We just and then the confusion of Molly Ringwald, cause that was so confusing. Cause you're yeah. like, do I want to sleep with her? Or do I want to be here? I definitely want her boots. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> it was very confusing. Very confusing. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to stop this and I'm going to go to the um, Q and A, John Kizak. There we go. Um, okay, here we go. Um, so, uh, questions. Let me see. Um, oh, this is such a good question. Um, can you talk about your use of we? One of the most important lines for me in the novel is the moment when Eulaby realizes I am missing. And I'm not oh. sure I'm supposed to identify these people, but I'm just, I'm going to not just in case. You're not going to identify them? Okay. But you know this person. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. All right, go. Um, uh, so we, I started writing the book, you know, I didn't know it took me a long time to figure out what this book was, obviously, since it started with Trump and then ended up here at this point. But I am um, I someone who really believes, and I'm curious what you think about this, Heidi. I just think there's, you have to, as a, when you're writing, just spend time, like three hours a day, or whatever it is that you assign yourself, just trying to write or in your room, like pretending to write, lying about writing, whatever it is. But I, because you, know, you never know when it's actually going to figure something out. And so I was writing by hand. I was trying to figure out my way into the story. And I just wrote, for what became the first sentence, we are 13, almost 14, and the streets of Seacliff are ours. And I somehow just knew that was my beginning, and I, it made sense to me. And I, then I, I canceled all my plans for the afternoon, just kept writing because I just didn't want to lose momentum. And I, I knew that the we that you feel when you're 13, when you really are solidified and bolstered by your friends, would turn into an I. And that actually, knowing that in advance helped me. Then I had to figure out why it would turn into an I. So actually, the we, the I, <laughs> happened before I even knew what the, what the event would be. Um, so that was like, a, that was my journey from me to, to I, yeah. And then I am missing, um, yeah, that came in later in the book when she realizes, again, it's the whole thing about seeing and not seeing. And um, I don't want to give too much away, but Eula B sees herself on the news, on the evening news and realizes that she has been reported missing. Yeah. Yeah, I love too how the we breaks down so quickly, you know, that um, it is, uh, yeah, like it instantly gets challenged and like the we breaks apart and it's like mm -hmm. she says she and Maria Fabiola are the we and then that very quickly gets splintered and yeah. Um, I think okay. anyone knows that anyone with like kids who are teenagers, teenage girls too, they they're, they see that dynamic in the we like that, you know, your daughter and your, or my daughter and her friends are so tight and you're just like you, you, they see themselves as a we and you're just like, is anything going to splinter? Is that going to not become a we at some point and what's going to happen and how will it happen? And, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting too that it's like it could be seen as like asserting your individuality, but like when you're that age, it's you're the outcast. <laughs> you know yeah, I mean? yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's see. How many different books did you? Um, let's see. How did you? Hold on. Oh, here we go. How did you uh, write to find the end? Um, I think that maybe that's a question just sort of about, I mean, I think I'm interested in you talking about the end actually mm -hmm. a little bit or not to give it away, yeah. but I think what's really interesting to me is that you did not choose to tell this book from a retrospective um, point of view. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I will say, I will, I'll give it away. So at the end of the book, <laughs> um, it flashes forward to, um, to 2019, um, deliberately so because before the pandemic. And I didn't, so the um, first section ends and 
the first like the youthful section ends and then there's a it goes to the present tense i think that's what the question is about right how did i decide to do that is that what the yeah. question is yeah i mean it seems i think they're curious about um the ending and uh, yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, i did that. well i thought i was done with the for, i thought i was done with the book and i i put it aside and i was working on it and then i was reading custom of the country you know i became very obsessed with edith wharton when i was writing this book um especially custom of the country because i just think it's such a great Book. It's such a great satire, um, and I think that Undine Sprague, the name, you know, the name of the girls' school the girls go to is called Sprague after Undine Sprague, um, and I named actually named all the schools in the book after um, Wharton characters just because it was fun for me to do that. Um, but she, she has this way in a custom of the country where she skips forward, especially with book five. Um, I know I'm getting really inside baseball here, but I'll just say she gets she can skip forward in time just with like a new chapter break. And I was reading Custom of the Country and I got to the end and I thought, oh my gosh, I love how she did that. I felt like that sense you are, you get like almost like an airplane taking off. And I thought, and I just started thinking about the girls in this book and what would happen, what it would say about friendship if, if I explored what happens to them in the current day. So that's how the end, ending came about. And I, um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting though, like I, I thought about this so much when I was reading it this time around that you didn't because you know that that voice is coming, like you know that that voice is coming, yeah. that future voice, that you didn't tell the um, teenager part of the book from that voice, you know? But I didn't tell, yeah, I didn't want to go, I didn't want to tell it from that point. I wanted to tell the, I wanted to experience in the present tense, like so much of it was like this, the saturation of feeling at that time. I feel like you're actually looking back at it, it's a different kind of nostalgic voice and it's not actually in the moment of being a teenager. And that's what I wanted, just like the things that are, interesting like you were pointing out the things that you say you know like when she will be is like sexually assaulted when she doesn't say anything if you were an adult looking back you would have to comment on that but i actually thought it was more true to be in the present tense and not have her comment on it yeah yeah i loved that choice i just thought that was like kind of a um i thought that was kind of an interesting choice because a lot of times if you do retrospective it allows you to be smarter you know what i mean yeah and and um, I like that you, um, and I'm not surprised because your writing is so um, streamlined and controlled that you were like, no, we're gonna just like, we're gonna cut all that out and we're just gonna be right on, you know? Um, okay, let's see. Uh, can, you, um, uh, can you talk about these we lessons that we take into adulthood? I think the end speaks so much to what we still carry from our teenage years into adulthood. Mm -hmm. and what we let go oh that's a great question well and i think i'm so fascinated by the friendships you have you know when you're younger when you're older and how how in some ways they change but in some ways they don't really change right like in some ways that you want to think that we're all growing up and things have changed but in some ways the dynamics are are so similar um and i have one friend who i grew up with who says that you know who went to an all-girls school and she says that she feels like she learned everything she needed to know from about office politics, she learned it, you know, going to an all-girls school, and I think that's really, really interesting. Um, and I, I, yeah, I don't want to say too much about it because I don't want to give away what happens at the end. But I, I wanted to play with that as well to see who, because again, there is a we at the end as well. She talks about we and what's happened to them, and then the we again at the end breaks into an I. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, how many different books did you start writing on your way to write <laughs> on the top? Um, <laughs> how many different books? I'm um, mostly the mostly the Trump book. I feel like for every book, I don't know how you feel about this, Heidi, but I feel like for every book you write, there's like a book that doesn't make it into the world. Am I the only one? And then you realize you look back and you see it's like a twin. It is a weird twin. Yeah. 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 Okay. So what was the book? It was the line. The Trump one. Yeah. The one about lies. Yeah. Okay. So what about you? How many books do you do for every book you publish? Uh usually one. It's usually a one to one. <laughs> Yeah, one to one. So same. Yeah, same ratio. <laughs> um, although, the, the, yeah, this last one is really hard to tell. But um, uh, what was my question going to be? Um, yeah, what will happen to that book? Oh, nothing. Like it's like know. literally nothing, nothing. Well, especially nothing, well, nothing will ever happen to it. Yeah, it, will, it led to this one. So I'm grateful for it. But it's yeah, nothing will ever happen. To you it. also want to talk about I feel like this is part of your process where um, you never back anything up on your computer. And then you <laughs> oh, yeah, that's the other reason that nothing will ever happen to it because my computer <laughs> just crashed last week and everything on it was not backed up because I don't anyway, for reasons that I 
won't go into right now, but I, um, but yeah, but I found it kind of liberating in some way. So that's why I can literally say that nothing will happen with that book because it's gone. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, let's see. Uh, you mentioned the three hours of writing. I'm curious how much time you devote each day to writing since you have so many responsibilities. Um, like watering your plants. I know. A lot of <laughs> I haven't even plants. done my watering the plant. I realized I haven't done that this week. Um, but I, um, I feel like during, well, I was going to say, I don't know if I feel like I have more responsibility or fewer responsibilities during COVID. That's an interesting question. But um, I, when I'm really working on something, I go more by word count um, than in hours. I'm curious about you, Heidi, what you do. But I... Um, What's your word count? I work, you, it's so geeky. Like when I'm really starting out something, it's like 500 words. And then if I'm in the middle of the book, it's a thousand words a day. And then I just have to get down. And it doesn't mean I keep them because I cut a lot of them out, but I have to get that down. So sometimes it can take an hour to get them down or you know, an hour and a half. And sometimes it can take seven hours. Wow. Um, yeah, it's funny because I, I felt like I had a thousand word. There was a while where I, I was doing a word count thing. And maybe it was because, um, I don't know, whatever, younger kids. I don't know, something about it. There was like, like time didn't really exist. So there had to be some other measure. <laughs> you right, know so you had to measure words, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like there really wasn't a time thing. There had to be some measurement, yeah. Yeah, right? And so it was <laughs> Otherwise, like, what have you done with your day? Yeah. <laughs> what have you done with your day? It's so true. Um, and uh, yeah, but I remember also, it's like a way that I have thought, well, you know, if you just wrote, a thousand words a day and your book is 60,000 words, you would write a whole book in two months, right? Right, but that never happens, right? Because you have to get rid of all the all the extra words. I know, but why doesn't it happen that way? It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make sense. So not fair. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, there are two sort of short questions. Um, oh wait, oh gosh, this is a good one. Has your teenage daughter read this book? Oh and yes, see her she mother has. reflected in any of the characters, even though she knows it's not autobiographical. Um, she is not reflected in any of the characters, but I think I do have a friend who's a therapist friend. You should always listen to therapist friends, and they, he said that um, you would relive when you have children. You relive each year of your life that they are going through, and I do. I've been thinking about this book because I did start the book when my daughter was around twelve. She's 15 uh -huh. now. So I, and I started kind of thinking about being that age and what was happening at that age and the sensibility, like there's just that heightened emotion. So again, it's not autobiographical, but like, I did start seeing how everything just takes on so much emphasis, right? <laughs> the smallest things can be the biggest things. And you prepare so much to go to like, whatever, a summer party. And the summer party lasts like four hours, but you prepared for like 10 weeks to go to the <laughs> summer party. And um, so I wanted to focus on that. Um, my daughter has read it. Um, she's not in the book at all. Um, she actually came up with the title, so that was um, a big help. I had lots of other titles before, and some of which I didn't like, or some which my publisher didn't like, and she came up with the title. So, how did she yes. come up with the title? She'd read it, and she was like, "Here's the title." Yeah, I think yeah. Amazing. Yeah, if yeah, you need title help, we can outsource that. To we can sell Fear Bucci shirts oh um, and um, title yeah. help. Yeah. Yeah, I would like some title help, please. <laughs> Um, okay, let's see. Uh, here we have some, uh, these are, these are like lightning round questions. Oh gosh. Um, let's see. Who would appreciate your lighting more, Eulabi or Maria? Fabiola? My lighting? Yes, your lighting, I think. <laughs> uh, Maria Fabiola, probably. Okay, yeah. okay good. Maria yeah. Fabiola. Okay. The sun goes, but she would not appreciate the hot tub room. That would not be like, yeah. um, do you like, are you a psychedelic furs fan? Um, I am. I wasn't then, but I am now. Yes. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Uh, what books have you read recently that you recommend? Ooh, um, that is such a good question. Um, God, I'm, I'm well, rereading Nella Larson's Passing, um, and I recommend that. I'm reading the Copenhagen Trilogy, actually, after going to a Center for Fiction event here last week with a Danish writer who talked about it and reminded me how much I wanted to read it. Um, other books I'd recommend um, Christopher Boland's book, A Beautiful Crime. I know you like that book a lot too, Heidi. Um, and what other, there's so many I read this past year. I really read a lot of, um, actually, I read a lot of mysteries. Um, I think I just wanted to have books with answers, like especially the start of COVID. I just wanted books with endings, books with answers. So I read a lot of mysteries. Um, I could have a list of like 25 that I could give someone who's curious. Um, yeah, but those are the books I would recommend recently. Um, okay. Okay. Also, oh, Lily, oh, also tomorrow night, Lily King, I saw is going to be at um, Center for Fiction. I loved her book, Writers and Lovers, was maybe one of my favorite books. I read the start of the pandemic and I, I love that book. Yeah, amazing. 
Um, okay, if this were a TV series and you could pluck a single character out of your book and do a spinoff, who would it be? Ah. Me, it would be Eva. Just so you know. Oh, Eva, the um, the au pair, the that Swedish au pair who comes. The person who asked the question, whose name is not uh, Gina Pell, she thinks that she would say, for me, it would be Eva. Eva would be the yeah. Swedish au pair. That's a great idea. She That's could be have her own series. Yeah. yeah. Who would your spinoff be? You have to answer this question. Oh, now I have to come up with my own. Um, yeah. um, I think I would do gentle. I'm really interested in working yeah. more about gentle um, and more about her life and exploring that more. And that's actually when I'm working on the script, I'm working more on gentle character too, and exploring her more. So, so another um, question that somebody asked is, has the book been optioned yet? I don't know if you're allowed to answer that question. I'm not allowed to answer that question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, well, it's 8.30. I think we're supposed to stop now. Um, is there anyone else who has another lightning round question for Vendela? Um, I also was asked about book recommendations. I'll just quickly say, um, if people have somehow made it this far into the pandemic without reading Severance by Ling Ma, I don't know what's wrong with you. Go and read it immediately. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, and Raven Leilani's Luster, I also read. Oh yeah, I love that too. Amazing. Yeah. Um, okay. I guess this is it. Okay, thank you so much. So thank you so much to the Center for Fiction. Thank you, Heidi and Marin Ireland. It's so nice to see both of you. And Marin Ireland, it's the first time I've actually gotten to talk with you. And thank you so much. And Heidi, thank you for, thank for doing you. this. And and I now I want to go shopping. So you know maybe okay, we can... if anyone seriously, I will. I am happy to share some links. Um, anyways, your book is so amazing, and congratulations. And um, thank you. yeah. Yeah, I love you. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks, Mommy. Bye. Thanks, Lauren. You guys are great.